Mr. Speaker, we in opening government believe that even though it is an idea that is idealistic to believe that academia is separate from the political and social workings of governments and the ways that societies work, that academia, and specifically Israeli academics, have such a strong control and access of a narrative that is spun about the way that the Israeli and Palestinian conflict exists in the Middle East and the way that it's supposed to be resolved, that it's imperative on Western liberal democracies and any society and group of people that is dedicated to international justice to step in and boycott them precisely because in the absence of boycotting them, they take control of the narrative in a way that disenfranchises Palestinians, takes away their access to meaningful representation, and makes it much more difficult for a meaningful idea of what is going on in the Middle East to exist. How are we modeling this motion? We're going to set this in all Western liberal democracies, and we're going to advocate this not just for governments, but for governments, businesses, private individuals, etc. We're going to say not that you always boycott Israeli academics, because that would be absurd and indefensible. Rather, we're going to say that when you believe that Israeli academics are preaching or are creating a narrative that is misrepresentative of what is the situation in the Middle East, specifically when they're preaching either an extraordinarily polarized, let's say Zionist narrative, or even when they're preaching a narrative that it is just misrepresentative of what Palestinians yeah. want, of sovereignty, of precisely what the interests of the not Israeli and not pro whatever the conception of Israeli sovereignty in the Middle East right now is, we're going to say you boycott them in terms of their access to representation in academic journals. We're going to say that you boycott them in terms of their access to the in economic avenues for them to represent themselves in terms of the scientific community. We're basically going to make it so that they're incapable of letting out their voice in terms of the research that they're doing unless they, uh, unless they force themselves to follow a standard in terms of following the way that the situation in the Middle East actually works. Yes? Yeah, academics is the process of uh, writing papers that approach the truth. Why are you predetermining what the truth is? Because we believe that in the status quo, there's a very, very clear distance between what the truth is and what Israeli academics and the large majority actually put out. Because we believe that these academics have a self-interested motive, both in terms of funding and in terms of their personal identity, to preach a narrative that is one that distances Palestinians from, for example, having a claim to meaningful sovereignty in terms of the Israeli land, and one that preaches something that is antithetical to a meaningful, peaceful sovereignty solution to the conflicts that we see going on in the Middle East. So yes, academics is the process of truth-seeking, but we believe in this precise instance that truth-seeking is dominated by personal interest in a way that is pervasive and in a way that is not solvable by anything other than boycotting. What am I going to tell you in constructive? Two things. First, I'm going to talk to you about how Israeli academics have access and have control of the narrative that the broader world sees about what is going on in the Middle East, and we believe that it's important for Western liberal democracies and people interested in actually finding the truth to make them have to at, like at, follow some kind of standard about what is actually meaningfully true going on there. And second, how we believe it's important to change the rational calculus in terms of what information they publish and how they decide to publish information about what's going on in the area. Andrew is then going to elaborate on why changing the rational calculus is going to lead to meaningful policy changes in terms of how the rest of the world perceives the area and how these academics interact with each other and with other academics in the field about what, whatever they're doing. So, first, let's talk about access and control to the narrative of what's going on in the Middle East. It's important to recognize that academics, specifically Israeli academics, have two areas of interest, right? The first area of interest is personal. As an academic, you want your work to be published, you want your research to be going out, you want other people to see it because that's going to lead to you getting more prominence, you getting more access to more academic work in the long term, etc. That's one incentive. The second incentive is one that's subtle and much more difficult for us to necessarily pin down. It's one that's more yeah. societal, where you believe that as an Israeli academic, you also must in some way advocate for the conception that Israel, for example, is more generally in the right and the wrong. You have an incentive to not portray your group of people yeah. as one that commits actions that are maybe possibly illegal by international standards, or actions that say that perhaps even against basic like rational intuitions, even against what we yeah. think is a peaceful solution to the Middle East, that you advocate for for example, Israeli dominance, and you advocate for 
not, for example, giving rights to Palestinians, or not even rights, but you advocate for not giving the same types of privileges to these individuals as you do to other members of the Israeli populations. That is important because a lot of these academics get support, for example, from, let's say, Israel, or support from other major groups of individuals that are pro-Israel and oftentimes don't take into account Palestinian interests in a meaningful way. It's important to recognize that absent boycotting their access to, for example, academic journals or other forms of economic and research self-expression, these individuals don't really have a disincentive for them to publish and forward a narrative that doesn't really take into account Palestinian self-interest, right? Because like they can get funding from other sources of pro-Israel like, uh, pro academics, oh. and as a consequence, their narrative, their narrative can get out. It's also important to recognize that Palestinians and people that aren't necessarily massively pro-Israel don't have the same access, both in terms of economic funding, because a lot of the times these groups just simply don't have financial backing, but also in terms of simple access to major journals and access to the publications that actually get the stuff out there, right? Because a lot of the times, especially in Western liberal democracies, for example, places like the United States, there is a lot of pro-Israel influence at the very top administrative levels of these academic journals and these organizations. What does that mean? It means that absent boycotting, you have no ability to change, to introduce the representation of not extraordinarily pro-Israel influences in academic journals. In the presence of boycotting, even if that boycotting isn't perfectly placed, and sometimes you might be boycotting Israeli academics that aren't entirely preaching like really, really misrepresentative narratives, but what you do get is you get more representation of not extraordinarily pro-Israel influences in important academic journals. Why is that important? Because you get more representation of Palestinian academics, but you also get more representation of just simply more neutral viewpoints from other areas and regions of society. And in the long term, that means that the people that are debating about whether or not, for example, the Israelis in the Middle East situation should be resolved one way or the other, have more viewpoints to take into consideration. And it means in the long term, we have more possible solutions to the crisis that are more geared towards compromise and more geared towards a non-biased perspective. We think that's the only way that you get that in our and you only get that on our side of the house, and that's important in meaningful kinds of change. Nor will we believe that in order to make them change the rational calculus, you need to have this kind of boycotting in place. Because only if their work can't be represented in this field of academics will they actually start taking into consideration other viewpoints. Otherwise, they have both financial, personal, and religious incentives to do what they were doing in the status quo and to represent the situation. in their best case scenario, where Israeli academics is a bunch of lies peddled as academia, even then they not once drew the link between how academia translates into political influence and Israel's policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. The common voter does not read academic papers, they listen to the rhetoric spewed by politicians. We think their case, even if true, does not have any impacts that they manage to establish. Two quick points of rebuttal before I move into my three substantives. Firstly, how isolating academia is completely arbitrary when they're completely unrelated to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Secondly, that, that like there's a unique cultural perspective that Israeli students and Israeli uh, like professors can provide, which leads to a sociological understanding of post-conflict reconstruction of societies with relevance to things like Sri Lanka and South Sudan in the modern day world. And thirdly, I talk about how isolation is bad, not just for the professors and students, but for the overall school of thought that deals with the so-called Israel Israeli dominance and Israeli hegemony. So two quick points of rebuttal. Firstly, they said, look, these papers have an advocacy for Israeli dominance and there is like not, not a multiplicity of ideas out there. If that is your problem, fund the Palestinian perspective, something we think already happens in universities of, such, of Egypt and other Arab states where Palestinian refugees have been going in. We don't think it's necessary to like, like stop the Israeli papers too. Israeli universities such as Tel Aviv and Jerusalem have active affirmative action policies to encourage Palestinian students, encourage Palestinian like readership, and encourage such kinds of research papers because of the unique history, right? It's a complete bunch of lies that was peddled by Prime Minister. Then they said, look, this is influence on, po on politics with absolutely no analysis. We don't think people read research papers. Then they said, look, we need a multiplicity of ideas, and once you boycott Israeli papers, you will have the more neutral perspective. No. 
Research papers and research journals already have a neutral perspective. When foreign journals accept Israeli papers, they also have foreign professors writing the counter view. Similarly, when Israeli journals have like papers written by foreign authors, they also provide the counter view. Except in your paradigm, nobody will have the incentive to fund like papers that go into Israeli journals and vice versa, thereby leading to isolation of the precise kind that you guys didn't want. Moving on to my first argument as to why isolating academia is completely arbitrary. One, because it's completely unrelated to the problem. It's not a chicken and egg question. We think the hatred towards Palestinians or the general victimization rhetoric that the Jews might have is born out of the Holocaust or out of the history and not because academia like indoctrinated them into believing that to be the case. What this means is the anti-Palestinian sentiment that's driven by politicians is driven purely because of vote bank incentives. When word of mouth across generations has painted a horror picture as to how Jews need to stay together and protect themselves because the entire world is out to get them, that can be peddled by word of mouth. That can be peddled by politicians to illiterate voters and not in the academic circles where people actually have standards such of peer review, etc. Which brings me to how this does not meet the standard for boycott. Their case cannot be, we will boycott research which does not stand up, uh, hold, hold scrutiny to academic standards. That's status quo. We do not, for instance, allow lies to be peddled in academic journals. We do not, for instance, allow like, like, the truth to be predetermined. Why is this so? Because there is no absolute truth, at least none that can be determined until it goes through the process of academic sure. check. Same. Various kinds of scientific theories, such as the phlogiston's theory of how heat is transferred, etc., were later proven to be false. What this means is, at the point at which a hypothesis is put forward, there's no way to determine truth. The peer review process and various levels of checks lead to what is a common consensus or what is the closest approximation of the truth. At the point at which you predetermine whether a particular piece of journal is false, you are pre like you're taking away from the our ability to know what the truth is, right? Say, secondly, that's the academic process, right? They can't say, like like take Papers can't lie. What can happen is papers providing a unique view which can't be completely discredited because it can't be disproved. That's valuable. You want such opinions out there because there has to be some basis in potential for truth for a paper to be published in a research journal. We think that feeds into the narratives, that feeds into the discourse, and as long as there is a counter view, which Western liberal democracies also fund to research, we don't see why boycotting those at the very source is necessary opening. The viewpoint advocated by these academics is also shared by journalists, is also shared by pro-Israel members of other forms of publications, which means this truth will get out one way or the other. But we tell you they control the way that the conflict is presented in terms of an evidence-based research comparison. That makes people who are later elites believe that the way that the conflict should be resolved Sit. is massively pro-Israel. How Sit. do you change that? If the evidence is incontrovertible truth, let it be published. If the evidence is a lie, it will be eliminated by the peer review process. We still don't see exactly what kind of things you're trying to boycott, which won't anyways be eliminated by the peer review process. If there is some potential for the evidence presented to be true, let it be presented because that's the academic standard. Same. Third argument, there's a unique cultural perspective which Israeli academics can provide, right? So you have professors who have unique history of the Holocaust because they've heard, like they're, they're passionate about the issue of racial violence and racial discrimination because of their own unique experiences. And you have research scholars who are passionate about the same, about the same subject area. Israel is in a unique scenario of having faced unbelievable racial violence and yet have developed to have the structures such as Tel Aviv University to be able to fund such research, right? Such opportunities don't exist in Rwanda, in Sri Lanka, in South Sudan, etc. What this means is, this is a unique opportunity for Western liberal democracies to actually accept such kinds of research. Where you have subjects who can give interviews for sociological paper. You have an active collection of people with their own experiences. You can actually study how the victimization of rhetoric plays out across decades, right? That's the kind of research that comes out. Most of it is obviously controversial for the simple reason that the Holocaust is controversial in terms of its content and in terms of its implications on people. What this means is, once you allow this academic, uh, like these papers to go through the peer review process, you understand how the victimization rhetoric plays across society, right? This has direct consequences on our ability to understand what policies should be taken by current post-conflict societies in, t in order to mitigate the kinds of like vitriolic rhetoric that we see, the far-right rhetoric that has become pervasive in politics. You can only do that when you don't boycott Israeli, uh, Israeli academic, uh, academic uh, like academia the moment it sounds controversial. Finally, how does this 
this hurts students. We think it's completely arbitrary to expect students in Israel, in Tel Aviv University, most of which are not lunatics, as we have seen many of them are, are our friends, to have to necessarily go out to foreign universities to carry out their research because funding as a whole will dry up, right? It's not simply the fact that bad research will be curbed. At the point at which all of the research is questioned as possibly having no standards of academia, funding across the board will go down. What this means is professors will find it significantly harder to carry out their research. Students will find it significantly harder to carry out their work. My deputy will talk about how this hurts their knowledge economy and in terms of Israel's development over time as well. But for for all of these reasons, it's arbitrary, it's harmful, we are proud to oppose. Thanks, I'll back across to the Deputy Prime Minister to continue to the government. and our case rest upon the acceptance of two kinds of facts. The first acknowledges how differently and how much more advantageously the Israelis control the academic narrative compared to their Palestinian, to, compared to their Palestinian calendar. They have incredible academic dominance, right? Like if you look at like the economics department at Stanford University, it's entirely Israeli, so nearly entirely Israeli. They perform incredibly well, their universities are world renowned, and in no way just do their like programs of you know, affirmative action, have, have in no way resulted in a similar Palestinian presence when it comes to creating history, when it comes to creating political theory, when it comes to doing economic analysis. Their papers, their reviewers, their journals are often biased for them or share the same views and issues. And they themselves have particular biases that we think are enhanced by their communities and their families, generated at the hands of the suffering that side opposition so clearly points out. When you publish a paper, you're accountable to your community in the same way that you're not when you're studying the Higgs boson or when you're studying, like, you know, uh, politics in some country that you have only a loose affiliation with. Because your community chastises you for the kinds of viewpoints you put out and the kinds of impacts that your research has. This is a biased group of people by nature, right, because they live in these communities, because they suffered from this thing, that are currently dominant. Perhaps, you know, by virtue of their own success, but that success is bringing terrible harm. The second thing that, this, that our debate asks you to recognize is what makes this kind of academic research different from most kinds of academic research that operate in the idealistic sphere. First, we need to recognize that the impact of this research is real and the impact of this research happens right now. When we talk about a paper that looks at the economic advantages of Israeli settlements uh, throughout Palestinian areas, right? That's a paper who's like not going to be interpreted in 20 or 30 years and is contributing to a theory of the electron, right? This is a paper that matters right now for what policymakers are deciding. That means that if we don't have a clear conversation, if we don't have criticism of these kinds of things, hold on just a second, then we, th when we get the only, we get one biased side and we have policies that follow that bias side. Later action won't fix this. The traditional academic process has a massive cost in terms of the time it takes and that cost is being paid dearly in this case. The second thing to recognize, and I'll go into this more, is that the opposition is absent. We don't have the pure academic process that we think we could have. Yes? So, sir, what do we do with academics that publish on things like Israel, but also publish really important things like, you know, about the Higgs boson and lots of other areas of expertise that really matter to scientific advancement in America? What's so, the there, there are harms that we're going to have to bite in terms of, like, the applicability of this research to other areas. There are harms we're going to have to bite in, like, these academics are either going to have to stop writing on those things or they're going to have to, you know, unfortunately, we're going to lose their research. We think the rational response that academics are going to make, that Ilya tells you about, is that they're going to change the way they write these papers. They're going to enhance the opposition that they have so they can continue their careers. We think they have a greater allegiance to the truth than, than to these kinds of things. Okay. I want to talk today about the policy changes that Ilya told you I was going to talk about and then they lambasted us for not talking about, right? So like how these things actually affect political change in the modern world. How it happens now is not that people read academic papers, flip through academic journals, and then decide they're pro-Israel. Right? How it happens now is that we generate the facts, the grist for the political mill, the grist for lobbyists that go and say, you need to support Israel in this case, because look at the economic advantages that settlements have. Right? Look at the way they're improving these kinds of communities. Look at the destruction that would happen if you moved Israelis back out of these areas. Right? And that becomes facts that turn toward our politicians. Those are facts that are generated from rigorous scientific analysis, good statistical analysis to back them up, so on and so forth. 
right? But they also affect the general public in some way, right? You open up the New York Times and you see an infographic that tells you about the economic situation with respect to settlements, tells you how many there are, where they are, what they're doing, and so on and so forth. That changes the public's view of what's going on. They do shape the narrative, and it's ridiculous to say, like, nobody reads academic papers. These things propagate through our system. So how it happens, in, how it changes in our world, however, right, is we think that you get better opposition to these kinds of facts. We think you get more vigorous critique of these kinds of statistical processes, and we think that you get uh, supportive uh, movements to to have the opposite perspective. They tell you, no, no, this is already covered, right? Conversation in academic journals already happens. There's already critique, and this is the third thing that I want to talk to you about in my speech today. They, they say they want to tell you that conversation is good. I'll, I'll take you in just a second here. But it's important to recognize that there's a very particular kind of academic conversation that's happening here that is unique to this case. Yes. If policy papers that determine what Israel's policy should be with regards to settlements are actually subjected to rigorous statistical uh, tests, as you suggested, why should we reject the conclusions of the same just because we don't like it? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to some material that I wanted to get to. Even when the analyses are correct, even when there hasn't been statistical fudging. And if you'll get any science, right, from biology, right, to physics, to whatever, right, to economics, God forbid, right? we know that we get it wrong all the time. Statistical analyses are horribly, I live with a psychologist, uh, bless her heart, but that field, uh, I actually have a psychology degree. But uh, that field has got some problems with statistical rigor, right? And we think political science, sociology have those same problems. These facts are often wrong. But when they are correct, it is important to recognize that just because something is true does not mean that that is the whole picture. Just because the numbers about the economic advantages of the Israeli settlements are factually correct and the impacts of moving them back out are indeed the case, it doesn't mean that that's the whole issue. What's important to recognize is what the Palestinian cost here is too, and that's something where no com comparable research is going into. That's something where the academic conversation is dominated on these particular facts, generated in these beneficial places. You're going to find the kinds of things that you're looking for, even if you're subject to statistical rigor. You're going to look in particular areas that advance your cause. You're studying the Israeli side of this. You want a pro-Israeli resolution. Your community, your peers want the same kind of thing. And as a result, the facts that are generated in this issue are almost uniquely the ones that are beneficial to the Israeli perspective. Even when the truth does come out, it's incredibly damaging to the Palestinian cause because they have no similar method to access the same kind of facts that justify policies in their favor. But we also tell you that the process itself often fails in these cases. We tell you that the personal beliefs of reviewers of, 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 of paper publishers like, often control like, what they research in the first place. They control how they conduct their statistical analyses whether they run a second or third uh, statistical test of a sort of different nature in order to get the result they want, whether they collect more sample size, like more subjects for their study in order to get the result that they want. Their political beliefs matter in this case, and the problem that makes us uniquely different from psychology is that the other side doesn't have the same access to the academic megaphone. We tell you that it's all, like, the, the experts that are supposedly reviewing their papers are often the same kinds of people. There are journals of Israeli politics, full stop. The editors in there are looking for statistical rigor, but they are not looking for the biased perspective in these kinds of cases. Mr. Speaker, the Israelis have a unique access to a particular kind of narrative that the Palestinians are not themselves able to access. If we don't put pressure on them and ask for an equal Palestinian presence, or else ask that these facts not be published so as not to create a biased perspective, we think the ultimate outcome is going to be that Israelis are going to want to continue this research, fund equivalent research in Palestinian issues, create the competitive academic market that we need. If we don't create that market, we think we have disastrous consequences. Thank you. Thanks. And I look across to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. On what exact basis have opening government just adjudicated this entire conflict in favor of Palestine? Like, they, they've given us no standards, no actual reasons why, like, the, the Palestinians are right, or, like, everything that's been said in the Israeli journals are wrong. They haven't told us exactly, like, what kind of material comes out in these academic journals, like, w how much truth there is, what type of opinions come out, whether it's, like, whether this material has a truth value, or whether it's just, like, people writing newspaper articles, which they could have done anyway, right, and they don't need an academic journal for that. We were, like, very little clarity from them other than them saying, oh, Israeli people are biased and are likely to write 
biased stuff, right? So three things in my speech. Firstly, I'm going to ask the question, what is academics? Secondly, I'm going to ask whether there exists a counter narrative to crazy Zionist professors uh, in the world, which there probably does. And thirdly, I'm going to talk about some consequences, right? So first, let me talk about what it, like what academics is, right? Because like open government in this debate have presumed some sort of like academic authority, in, like in in deciding that this like this particular body of academic research isn't worthwhile and like needs to like needs to go. But that's not how international academics work, right? We have peer reviewed journals that like have that publish papers yes, and like and, and they're critiqued by people of the same sort of field, right? And each of these journal no, each of these journals has has its own sort of legitimacy and credibility based on the peer review process, based on the, the manner of academic rigor. Right? So here's the thing. Most international journals that are that are taken seriously have a very rigorous process of evaluating the truth and like dealing with the quality of a paper. At the point at which you're literally like 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 printing rubbish and writing rubbish and publishing it to the international community, it's not going to get accepted by any decent journal and isn't likely to get like published anywhere, right? And ultimately, people who want to like publish lies can do it anyway. So we don't think like like opening government like claiming some sort of academic authority and saying, okay, we as the international academic authority of Western liberal democracies claim this to be absolutely false, right? We don't think it works that way. We think it's based on credibility of the peer review process and like that's all the analysis that's gone unresponded to from um, the leader of opposition, right? But secondly, like does it does there exist a counter narrative in our world? to like, like Zionist professors saying these Arabs need to be killed. I'm sure that does, Mr. Speaker. Within Israel, there does exist a counter narrative and we sure. can see that we can see that, for example, from the fragmentation of political parties in Israel, right? Many of them are pro-Palestine and like anti um, um, like anti-settlement and they want to return to pre-1948 or at least pre-1967 uh, borders, right? Like, so yes, the counter narrative exists. Is it being is it being drowned out? Maybe within Israel, but that's because they're Israeli, perhaps. Uh, but in the rest of the world, that's not how it works. But like, here's the thing, right? Palestinian universities also exist, guys, and Palestinian professors also do. If they're not as well funded as Israeli are, we're happy to fund them as well as Saradeep said. But um, like, yeah, the, the counter narrative does come out of there in favor of Palestine. And like, given that most people in this room would probably have like either a neutral or a pro-Palestinian viewpoint, it's completely like completely out of line saying Israel is dominating the discourse. Even if, like, even if they're like better funded we still think the counter narrative can come through and like and when you've got like professors from Harvard like Mersheimer and Walt talking about how the IPAC is like controlling like a, a lot of US policy and is lobbying really really hard we think the counter narrative comes from outside as well we don't think any of what they're saying is remotely true right let's uh, b before I move on Sorry. to um, yeah consequences I'll take it. there is a minuscule counter narrative but when an Israeli academic publishes a paper on how suicide attacks from Palestine is harming Israelis, what is the statistical check or truth check that says, is there a Palestinian viewpoint to this paper? Yeah, uh, there probably aren't two viewpoints about whether suicide bombings are harmful, right? Like, but like, assuming, assuming you gave me some other example, right, there always is going to be a Palestinian, like, if, if the truth value of something is, is, is contestable, then like, there are ways of determining whether something is true or factually correct. If there are different opinions and different viewpoints, they always come about in different ways. And we've already told you, right, rather than killing the Israeli narrative, we're happy to promote the Palestinian narrative as well. That's just really, really good for academic discourse and public discourse as well, right? Uh, closing of, uh, let's go. Okay, so, so um, isn't it possible though, do you think it's possible for academic research to be technically rigorous but still morally reprehensible? Yeah, I think that is possible. But I think it's always really good to have morally reprehensible academic research come out in the public domain so that you can critique it, so that you can refute it, so that you can actually just address those concerns and claims, right? Like I'm gonna get like I was gonna Sorry. get to no, I was gonna get to isolating schools of thought as one of my consequences like slightly later, but I'll get to it straight away, right? So one of the consequences of this is that it's going to isolate this school of thought and make it terribly inbred, Mr. Speaker. So normally there exists a healthy flux in academics, right? Like Israeli professor will pro uh, produce a paper, he gets peer reviewed from people by people from Australia. USA, whatever, 
right? And then there's exchange of knowledge. So there's normally a healthy international flux as far as academics and transfer of knowledge is concerned. Banning Israeli academics as some Western liberal democratic authority on academics, right? What's going to happen is that either they're go like the best professors from these universities are going to like leave like Tel Aviv and go to Oxford and like and publish from there. Or what's going to happen is you're going to have a terribly inbred culture out of order, terribly inbred culture within Tel Aviv and Ben Gurion and all, all these places, right? Where they continue without without check, without refutation, without critique to like to spew these sorts of like horribly Zionist views that opening governments seem to be so afraid of, right? So we like we think a lack of exchange of knowledge and a lack of like cross refutation and cross critique really, really is going to be harmful, and we don't think that makes sense, right? But like. Let, let's talk about how this hegemonizes academic culture anyway. Saradeep spoke to you about how, as a post-conflict society, Israel has a unique narrative to provide both to academic discourse and to public discourse, right? What's likely to happen under their move is that like, the best academics from Israel are going to leave and they're likely to go to the traditionally strong universities if they're good enough for them, right? Which means that these academics and professors provide their talent to traditionally strong uh, schools of thought and become prol prolific uh, academics within those schools of thought rather than creating a new one from Israel, right? That is valuable to the discourse, that is a legitimate claim even if they're taking the Israeli side and that is com like opening government's model is completely arbitrary because it determines the truth and calls this conflict in favor of one side. We don't stand for it, we are proud to oppose. And then across to the member of government to continue with the government and open up the closing government. Mr. Speaker, we reject the characterization that the gov bench has come down on the side of Palestine and has immediately rejected any arguments for Israel. Rather, what we would tell you is that individuals and academics who are using their position in academia and using support from the state and focus on those individuals and their studies to advance a particular political agenda and using it towards particularly heinous or morally reprehensible ends, which is not reflective of the overall discourse on Israel um, from both Israeli and other experts internal academics. We think that those individuals ought not be given the platform and legitimacy and be able to ex exert that influence. But I want to talk about, in our extension, more specifically, the way we think this becomes an incredibly powerful policy to be able to actually moderate, inf uh, moderate uh, institutions writ large of academic and higher learning within Israel and worldwide, and the way that this fundamentally changes the way they engage with their students, the voting populace, <coughs> uh, and the world writ large, as well as like obviously the academic community. Uh, going to advance to you some arguments about why we think this uniquely is good for all of these things. But I want to deal with a bit of brief reputation first. So I think that one of the big things that we hear out of the opening opposition team is this understanding of like, look, if these things are true, if they are legitimate things that can make it through a peer review, the most powerful and constructive thing to do is critique them, have outside people, recognize the problems with these things, and publish it. So I think that first of all, insofar as they answer RPY, that like, yes, things can be morally reprehensible or sort of morally reprehensible ends and still be technically rigorous, but that's the way that we should attack it. I think that we tell you if we, like, if we determine certain things are advocating for a particular ideology of like a, a you know, removing human dignity from individuals or being extremely resistant <coughs> to any sort of uh, like collaboration or uh, reaching a peaceful solution, that the most powerful critique is to say, we do not recognize this as legitimate uh, parts of academic discourse. We think this is something that, because of the ends that it serves, ought not be considered in this way. I think that there are people that can make extremely technically rigorous academic arguments about the economic benefits of slavery and I think that when people did things like that, these were the same ways that people perpetuated arguments about slavery within the United States, right? I think that these are the same sorts of things. Like, Look, there are benefits, we have to continue this, creates a discourse, and then we tell you that insofar as we recognize that academia does have this political influence, we do have some obligation. But they say that it gets worse because we're going to isolate this school of thought. So I think that insofar is this means that literally these people are now like stripped of an academic standing. It means that these people are uh, then uh, operating from a place of lower legitimacy, which means that even if they 
operate uh, being like isolated. And even if this like somehow radicalizes people who are you know more uh, already prone to uh, certain like academic uh, beliefs and defenses, I think it means that they're less likely to be able to exert that influence. And more importantly, that other individuals who are outside of the academic uh, realm, and I'll take you a moment, uh, outside of the academic realm, can't point to their work and say, look, this is why I act based on this. This is my justification for continuing to uh, enact a certain set of policies. <coughs> sure. The problem is, is that you assume isolation of a group which believes that it is unfairly and in many cases anti-Semitically isolated by others is going to change the actual reactions that these people have, which historically has been something that they've been very hostile to and wouldn't actually react in the way. I don't think we're actually even all that concerned with changing the minds of these individuals. Like I reject the premise of that. I think that we tell you that there are plenty of other far more moderate individuals on both the Israeli and Palestine side that have more of a uh, like non-biased and non-Zionistic approach to defending these things. So like yes, if these people are isolated and they all like want to go and yell in their non-accredited room with their non-peer-reviewed papers, that's fine. They can do that. Like we hope they enjoy themselves. Uh, but we think this is far more important on a macro level than for those individuals. And I'm not sure what power they'll exert when the entire Western academic community has said, nope, you are no longer relevant, and then like, how that's going to affect anyone. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what we're extending, about how this actually moderates institutions. So I think that there's an understanding within all academics, uh, much as my professors like to groan about, of an understanding of publisher parish. That academia is not something you simply like hold a post and you can just, you know, do whatever you want there uh, and like, it, you know, there's no uh, repercussions, but rather the people have to be consistently contributing to their academic field, and in particular, institutions are concerned with remaining academically relevant and having the best and most advanced and engaged uh, professors. You want people that are going to conferences, publishing well, are respected, these sorts of things. So I think that this, first of all, uh, this policy creates an individual level decision for you know the uh, most like vehemently pro-Israel uh, professors and researchers. We tell you that they can like recognize that they're probably going to lose their career, they're going to be able to lose their academic status, and that, uh, that they're probably going to be forced out by virtue of the fact that they're no longer able to do this. So I think that many people will simply have to leave, or they'll have to moderate. And I think that there are probably some people who have been influenced by saying, like, look, uh, you know, it is beneficial to the state if you publish in this way, if you approach these questions. And that there are people that actually would prioritize their academic research over those counter-narratives. I think that there are probably people on the margins, that, uh, though I, like, again, still don't care about, you know, breath so. angry people. Um, but, so, the next thing that we tell you is that, uh, in, so, insofar as the, uh, institutions make these sorts of decisions, in the status quo, like many institutions in their host nations, they and the state gives things uh, like funding, uh, appoints chairships, uh, gives grants to individuals. So the state actually has a very active role in many universities, in particular in Israel, in determining the academic course of where they're going to go and what they uh, fundamentally uh, like fund and value within those institutions. The problem is because uh, the state has a vested interest in highlighting individuals who are uniquely pro-Israel and able to provide academic backing for policy initiatives, this means that voices get drowned out within those institutions. Because when you're determining who's going to be the chair a particular department, and it's something that's actually decided by individuals in the state because it's good, uh, it's something that, because of the affiliation of funding and the way that these things are appointed, or you're determining who's going to get grants or who's going to represent Israel at a particular conference. This means that the individuals that are being chosen um, are often influenced by the like pro-Israel narrative. But I think that we have people that are actually meaningful counter narratives, um, and that would actually be far more powerful. So you actually have to move to the people who are now relevant. Um, insofar as uh, you don't take us, um, we tell you that they have to actually choose people that are valuable and they're going to be able uh, to uh, actually create these more balanced narratives. So I think this is good for the peace process because it means that you get like better funding and travel and proliferation of pro uh, like peace process uh, Israeli academics because I think it's uniquely powerful when it comes from Israeli academics from within Israel, not just representing the Palestinian perspective as we heard a little bit from opening government, but rather the perspective of what is good for Israel writ large from a more moderate perspective. But I think that this also means that you have a different change in the influence on uh, students, that now the professors that are able to like create this discourse and have these discussions are also allowing the students to recognize that, like, look, if you want to participate in academia and if you want Israel to not be isolated academically, these are the ways that we need to approach these things. So I think that creates a generational moderating process. But I think that this also creates an influence on the way that the voting public understands all, uh, all of these things. That I think that this creates, that means that people who are in places of cultural uh, presence and people who are appointed to things like cabinets because of their academic standing are actually people that are more moderate because you can't say, like, look, I appointed this person, they're very qualified if they haven't published in 10 years because they have been consistently rejected by that academic community. It creates greater legitimacy for the voices that are being disproportionately drowned out, which is the large majority of liberal minded academics. Thanks, Simon. Question to the member of opposition to continue for the opposition. Here we
two things that I think myself and Victoria are going to bring to this round that uh, I think will be quite important. First of all, I want to talk about unique Israeli contribution to academia and why, in many cases, not just limited to the narratives that they talk about, it's very important and will, in many cases, probably not exist to the same extent on their side of the house, or at least will be highly limited in terms of collaboration. But second, I want to talk about how this actually impacts the psychology, for instance, of the academics that they're so concerned about, and what's likely going to happen when you treat a unique Israeli uh, culture uh, as, as, as an institution which, is going to, which will be competitively com uh, compelled to change in the ways that they suggest. I think they're unlikely to have the impacts that they uh, claim to have. So refutation first, three points of refutation. One of the things that we get from both sides of the house, second, uh, second gov to a little bit of a different extent, is the idea that we need to change incentives of academics to um, abandon harmful and incorrect positions. Second gov says this is important for the you know, moderate per pe uh, people in academia, because then those people will change their positions and perhaps counter, uh, uh, battle the counter narrative and, and add to that. Few responses. So first of all, I think in the large majority of cases, they don't actually change the core beliefs of the individuals involved or lead to these people speaking out on the other side, right? Because one of the biggest issues with their side of the house is that the affirmative material that they give us to suggest that there will be any benefit relies on those people not just, for instance, no longer talking about the positions that they have, whether it be a researcher who is talking primarily about the Israeli-Palestine conflict, or a scientist, for instance, who has also published on politics. It also relies on that person changing course and, like, and publishing things that are completely different than what they originally did. I think that insofar as these people probably had core convictions that led them to write these things initially, I find it hard to believe that these people will be like, well, yeah, I'll just start publishing these Sorry. other things that I was willing to speak out about on a large level. I don't think that they get that type of offensive material on their side of the house. But also I'd suggest to you that there will be instances where people decide for themselves that it is not worth it to them for their, for like, for their society or for their interests as an Israeli to actually uh, stop speaking out or to do these types of things. Even if this is rare for some academics, we lose the contribution that these people involve. I'll get to that in my extension more particularly. Sure. But second of all, they say that Israel control, like Israeli academics control the discourse on the conflict and we need to have a different narrative. So this is first of all highly asserted and not at all proven by their side. I'd suggest to you that insofar as a large portion of the Israeli position comes from Israel and some Western scholars that sympathize, you actually probably have a situation where the other side of the discourse, especially in academia, is the more persuasive one. So what you get on their side of the house is not a balancing of positions, but rather a situation in which that other side of the discourse becomes far more prevalent. Now that would be great if side government could prove to you that that was an infallible side of the discourse that was objectively true. But I think that first opposition tells you to some extent why there are problems with that, but it's also issues of, for instance, groups of that, uh, that, that discourse being problematic. I think that's important. Sure. Uh, so yeah, those are the three points of reputation I have. Yeah, very quickly before I A meaningful start. opposition is not just statistics. It's experts who understand the situation. Where are those Palestinian experts who will critique these Israeli papers? So like, first of all, there are Palestinian experts that speak out, whether no, they be no. in Western, Western universities or elsewhere. But second of all, they have many allies that I think are also able to do that. I think this point is very, not very good for your side of things. All right, extension. First of all, the unique, uh, like, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, academia, academia and public discourse in Israel. So one of the things that I think it's really important to understand in this round is how often many Israelis, especially those Israelis who are willing to speak out about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, view themselves in their society and view the Israeli-Palestine conflict. In a lot of cases, I think they somewhat correctly view them as being the victims of combative stances throughout yeah. history and currently that leads them to suggest to themselves that many of these individuals who want to, for instance, boycott, divest, and sanction are the types of individuals that are, in many cases, lazy and anti-Semitic and that they don't want to actually engage with the unique perspectives of Israelis. A lot of Israelis do not think that people outside of the country can relate to the unique threat, security harms, and interests that exist for people every day, like the threat of rockets or things like that. You might claim that in many of these cases these are delusions that they're not actually as persuasive, but these are things that actually exist in the minds of many Israelis. The reason that this is important, Mr. Speaker, is because insofar as these individuals believe this, you have to question what the best method for compelling those types of individuals is if we really want to get the objectives of side government. If it's true that these people believe that many of the current opposition, whether it's in Palestine or the Western world to some degree or academia, is not is hostile and isn't actually uh, uh, 
like actually trying to engage with the Israeli position, then I think that you get act not just in effective means on their side of the house, but counterproductive ones. Why is that? Because of the fact that the West actually has, I think, a very important and, st and true role to play in, in Israel and Palestine to be able to have some type of moderation or some type of solution. Insofar as is the case is that there are very few states currently that have the ability to negotiate with, Pal uh, with Israel and to be able to say to Israel that you need to make certain concessions, you need to do certain things with any degree of credence. On their side of the house, what they get is a situation where that goes, where those states go from reliable and in some cases trusted actor to complete enemy because of the fact that they have jumped ship and joined on a train which many Israelis believe is anti-Semitic and completely opposite to their interests. If it is the case that these individuals, that this, their side of the house wants to ensure the goals that they say, it is far better for the West to remain an actor, which, which is perceived, whether it's in academia or whether it's in government institutions, not necessarily as an always ally of Israel. We don't think that's necessarily the case that needs to happen, but someone who is willing to accept Israeli arguments. You do not get that on their side of the house when any counter-narrative about Israeli experience is stifled, dismissed, and completely ignored. I think that some of those are uh, actually valuable, I think that's important. But let's talk about the unique Israeli contribution to academia, right? Because there are many examples of this that end up being important that they just say they're going to bite the harm of. Let's give you some examples. Thriving tech research in Israel, the Higgs boson in physics, anthropology, government collaboration on nuclear technology and green technology in the United States. Their moral position will lead to all of these fields, in many cases, losing certain types of uh, workers. Why is this the case? Because academics are not always solely one topic research oriented. For instance, Noam Chomsky is way more important in the field of linguistics than he is in politics. But if you told Noam Chomsky that he could no longer publish about politics in the United States, that I think that in a lot of cases you would ignore the other valuable types of mechanisms that he gives to academia. That's incredibly important. They certainly lose some of that, Mr. Speaker. We think that we benefit from it. The impacts of science, the impacts of culture are important. They lose it. We are proud to oppose. Thanks. And I look across to the government to close out with the government bench. Mr. Speaker, what we would tell you is that not all Israelis are quite as paranoid as the picture that second opposition would put to you. We think that actually individual uh, academics within Israel are quite capable of looking at the justifications uh, that, it, that the West might give for, say, putting sanctions on because of the, uh, because of the horrors committed on the, on the borders uh, of, of the Israeli state and not view it as just a, a relentless push in an anti-Semitic direction, but rather a, a justified response and one that, uh, one that they can actually understand. I think the, the, the nuance that they miss in terms of thinking about the actual way that these academics think about the situation is recognizing the state's role in actually polarizing these people and giving them incentives to actually create the types of polarizing invective that, that infe infect the political discourse within Israel to push it to be more, uh, more radical. At the point where we change those incentives for the state, we think we change the incentives for the abundantly moderate and well-educated people within Isra uh, Israeli academia. So I want to talk about two things in this speech. I want to first talk about how this changes the internal politics of Israeli academia at a structural level, and then how that actually translates into meaningful domestic po uh, political change in Israel. So first of all, I think opening government establishes the problem here in saying that academia's role is creating a set of facts that tends to over-represent a certain set of perspectives. Uh, so even if you thought that uh, first opposition was, tr uh, was correct in talking about how you need intersubjectivity to reach truth, they give more uh, weight to certain kinds of subjectivity on their side of the house, so you get a, a portrait that is skewed in favor of uh, Israelis. We think that that's harmful because it influences po politicians' uh, uh, politicians' beliefs about what is the uh, set of facts uh, available, but it also influences the populace's belief via the media. Now, we think that the, uh, what Taylor brings to you here, though, is what we act how we actually solve that problem. 
Because what she tells you is that the, uh, many, in many cases, that type of uh, uh, research is biased uh, towards a more uh, Zionistic direction because of the actions of the government. Because many, uh, uh, many of the most important institutions within the Israeli academic sphere are funded directly by the government. That you have huge public universities that control a massive amount of the research that is done in these places. But it's also just the case that even if we're talking about private universities, like any other uh, university atmosphere, that a, a huge amount of that research and a huge amount of endowed professorships and a lot of the other ways that uh, these institutions can operate is funded by government grants, is funded by, gov uh, by, uh, by government expenditure and tax revenue. So what that means is that when you have people like Net Netanyahu controlling the government, it means that they're going to uh, that, that they're going to reward those people that have more radical views and. Even even if that's not true, it's rational for individual politicians or individual academics from a career-minded perspective to, to further that type of research, to hedge their bets, to know that that's the type of research that is more likely to be favored by the government, more likely to get them uh, future funding, and therefore bi bias them even uh, preemptively in that direction. So, so what we think that means is that you get people who would not otherwise publish as, as radical of views or leave out Palestinian perspective to the same degree do so more in the status quo. Hmm. So what we tell you we change on our side of the house is at the point where the, uh, those academics are now facing these, uh, these countervailing incentives where they know that they will no longer get published, they will no longer have access, uh, they will no longer have access to conferences in the rest of the Western world. We think that those are relatively strong uh, incentives for individuals to moderate. But it's also incentives for the state to moderate because they view their own academics as being cut out of all the beneficial research that Brett wants to talk about. All the research and collaboration that, that would actually lead to economic growth or, uh, or increased knowledge within Israel. We think those things are tremendously uh, are, are a tremendous incentive structure for the state to change the way that they reward uh, academic research in order to reflect a, 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 more, a stronger affirmative <laughs> action position and a stronger uh, diversity of, of views. The other thing they tell you, though, is uh, 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 the other thing they tell you is that there are radical viewpoints that won't moderate in many uh, that there are other people who won't moderate who won't respond to this incentive structure. So we would say among those academics, we still provide a lot of meaningful impacts. First of all, they can still be their research can still be discussed. Contrary to first opposition, you can still condemn those individuals or their research in your journals. We're just saying don't give them a platform. But uh, but also you have lower legitimacy of those views within academia. That those views at this point don't have that positive platform. They don't have legitimacy within academia. But more, more importantly, they also just have less legitimacy within Israel because none of their research is getting published outside of uh, literally one state. It's viewed as just a it's viewed as the equivalent of someone who writes in a journal that has literally no circulation. Those, we think those people, uh, uh, we think those people are just viewed as fundamentally less important so, and fundamentally have a harder time exercising any sort of influence. Okay. So uh, sure, talk about. Yeah. Right. Please be the first speaker on government bench to tell us what exact standards of moral repugnancy this Western liberal democratic academic authority is going to use while judging which papers need to be boycotted. I mean, I don't think we have to give you like the most like outlined standard on that. I think what we'll tell you is just that you underrepresent voices, and so when you have the perspectives of those people that not being paid attention to, you're likely to get biased perspectives. Second thing I want to look at then is how this changes domestic politics in Israel. Because most people are not the paranoiacs that Brett paints. We think that these are individuals, who are academics who have traveled and researched abroad, who are aware of the controversial components of Israeli foreign policy and domestic policy, and that they're not likely to be radicalized as a response to these, uh, 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 if anything, they're radicalized as a response to rational professional incentives, as I've already talked about. But what we do uniquely on our side of the house is shift legitimacy towards more moderate perspectives. We think that that's incredibly important in strengthening the hands of those people within universities. So those are the ones that are more likely to get endowed chairs, or they're more likely to get their research uh, cited or funded. We think that that means that they are the ones who are going to actually uh, disproportionately be the ones who are now teaching in these universities. That you change, you have curriculum change within these universities. You have a, a, a difference in terms of opportunities for students to conduct research. And at the point where you have thousands of students going through more moderate institutions that are shaped by more 
moderate academics, we think you get the intergenerational change that Taylor talked about, where you now have people being brought up in a system that is less polarized, that neglects the voices of Palestinians and other perspectives on the conflict less. We think all of those things are tremendously important in actually resolving the conflict in the long run. So for these reasons, we propose. <laughs> Okay, thanks. And then I'll cross to uh, the opposition left, to close up the opposition bench and the debate as well. Two themes. First of all, I'm going to talk about the Israeli conflict. Or sorry, first of all, I'm going to talk about boycotting and academics, and then I'm going to talk about the Israeli conflicts. So listen, one of the types of discourse that academics perpetuate in comparison to other people, right? I think that Brett and I give you a pretty compelling case that like it's likely that these people are less dogmatic, that are like more moderate, or individuals that actually participate in discourse. Because who are the people that will actually gain ground in North American academic fields? What proposition on that half tries to tell us is that, listen, you're going to drown out any moderate voices. But do moderate voices really get drowned out in the Western context? Or do they get drowned out when you push it into the Israeli context and only allow people to publish within their small yeah. paradigm, right? Yeah. I think you get better discourse when you put people in the West and scholars that actually have legitimate opinions that will create lasting peace get credence because that's what the West wants to see. I think that's a far more likely outcome on our side of the house, where these people are actually perpetuating their views in a light that is going to be sympathetic towards more moderate views. But what else do they tell us? Is that, okay, so what we get out of opening gov is like, research can be biased and Israeli scholars have disproportionate power. I think that opening up tells us, listen, like, journals don't publish blatant lies, these are emerging studies. I think what Brett and I tell you is that where do we actually get this type of change from, right? Like, should we allow people to suggest that at any time that these one particular group have an irrational stance that shouldn't ever be supported? I think that's just fundamentally not the case, right? I think that we've given you a reasonable, like, sorry, we've given you reasons to believe that people living within Israel do actually feel a special sense of community, that they are unlikely just to sort of like give up, as proposition would like you to here, say, here. their other beliefs, right? Realize that these are really fundamental, that it's kind of dangerous living in Israel. And like a lot of the reason people choose to do it and support this cause, in spite of the fact that in many areas it's not politically uh, popular and is politically contentious, is because they genuinely believe that people have been marginalized throughout history, and it's important that they continue to perpetuate their race and their religion. I think that this is something that needs to be taken into account when considering what this conflict actually means to the people living there, and to suggest that like scientists are going to no longer care about their homeland as a result of us telling them they can't publish these things anymore is really unlikely. Here, here. I think what we didn't get out of opposition or proposition is any engagement with all of Brent's material about the types of technology and collaboration that we as Western liberal democracies benefit from right now, right? Realize that there is really important research happening in technology, in green energy, and lots of other fields that is largely based on Israel and that is highly cooperative with the West. Insofar as we marginalize them as an ally, we aren't going to get any of this type of cooperation. Here, here. This is exactly yeah. what you are going to do, right? You marginalize individuals when you tell them their beliefs are illegitimate. And I think you also silence people that are moderate because you make people feel more Zionist, feel more marginalized, here, when you here. actually put them in a situation where you are marginalizing. I'll take you closing. So for every like Zionist individual that you might be alienating, don't you think there's another individual whose voice has been lessened within these institutions, has not been able to be successful, that now is a viable source that no, we can No, I think I've just dealt with that. But within the Western conflicts, it's moderates with ideas that can actually create peace that are the ones that get the most credence. I think you get that on our side of the house. And you only get the crazy Zionist views on your side of the house because those are the only people that are going to get their voices heard within Israel once the West rejects them, right? Because you are pushing people into this type of reality. Okay. So I think that I've largely dealt with this idea of like what research is like. Yeah. Uh, so what is what are what are they trying to tell us on research? Listen, P 
people outside of academia will use these works, that like people are going to get behind these types of dogmatic works that uh, individuals are putting out. So first of all, I think they give you pretty compelling reasons as to why the like, discourse is actually more modern on our side of the house, because of Western interests. But I also think that the people are not like made violent by the realities uh, that like an individual publishes in a paper. Like, people are made violent because of the ethnic conflict in this area, and then like use whatever it is that they need to to be able to perpetuate that class. If you think that like an Israeli paper published in Israel by a Zionist wouldn't be equally compelling as like a pub paper published in North America, that's just an absolutely ridiculous stance, right? Like people will use the Bible, people will use these papers, people will use whatever they can get their hands on to further their cause. So I think it's just ridiculous to suggest this holds some type of like special place, and that other types of academia coming from with outside of North America no. wouldn't hold this exact same credence, right? You're talking about an Israeli conflict, a context where people actually support Israel. No. Okay, and I've already dealt with this idea about people hearing out voices, and I think that closes my first theme about boycotts and academics and why we actually care about them, why we think you're just going to marginalize these groups. What I also think is really important is what actually happens in the Israeli conflict, not yet. What opening government tells us here is that people are going to stop running their pro-Israeli views. Opening opposition tells us that Israel has evolved out of the Holocaust. What I think Brent gives you really compelling analysis on here is like the Israeli mythos, right? That people live in a state of fear, and that this fear is ill understood often, or at very least these people feel that their fear is ill understood. Insofar as this is a group that already feels marginalized, and you're going to continue to marginalize them further. I don't understand how you suggest that we are going to create peace. What Brett tells you is that under the status quo, we get to be a trusted arbiter, right? We get no engagement out of closing government about how we actually are going to meaningfully engage in any type of conversation with Israeli academics who, as they say, will be important in bartering any type of peace or reconciliation if we don't allow them to be present in our academic discourse here, here. and we tell them that their opinions are illegitimate, right? I think that what they need to engage with in this round is that you get discourse out of positive interaction. You don't get it out of harsh sanctions where you don't allow people to have their voices heard and they feel marginalized. Hey, ah, sorry. Um, listen, I think that what they've tried to suggest is that all Israelis are not as parents as we suggest. But in the same breath, what we also heard from the whip speaker is that, listen, there are horrors that happen on the border. I think that this marginalization and this feeling of marginalization comes from a legitimate place, right? I don't think it's wrong that individuals who have suffered such historic oppression feel the need to perpetuate their views. Is the West going to support all of these views? Brent and I have already told you no, right? It's not as if we're suggesting that the West has to whole hog buy into anything that's radical. But we think we get the most moderate discourse under us the house. We have the most respect for the Israeli context. And through this respect, we can build lasting peace and continue to be a trusted actor and arbiter. If we just cut them off, we stop academic discourse. We open the field for individuals who hold beliefs that we don't want propagated because they will be supportive of the Israeli conflict. They will be supportive in Israel if we further push people into believing that they are actually marginalized. We are the only team in this round that gives you a clear case for how we actually get lasting peace, how we actually engage as the West. We are very proud. Of you.